Hi Life Group Leaders. Today we're going to be previewing Lesson 9 in Hosea chapter 10 beginning verse 5. And I don't I assume you're aware of this and you've probably shared this with your class, but uh, I want our students to know that this is it for the nation. Hosea is the last prophet that's prophesying to the northern kingdom and he's telling them that calamity is about to happen and so that's why I say this is it for the northern kingdom there is no other prophet after Hosea they had slid into full-blown debauchery uh, and this of course led to Assyria taking them into exile and into captivity in 722 BC. And so we're seeing the winding down of the northern kingdom and the ending of the prophets to the northern kingdom in, uh, in them telling them about the disciplines that's coming from the Lord. Now, let me mention to you that I thought our lesson writers did a really good job in their introduction. In fact, I'm going to use some of their words in my lesson on, on the top of page 77. Here's what they wrote. Breakups are painful, and they very rarely happen suddenly or for a single act. Did you get that? Breakups are an accumulation of bad actions and attitudes from a bad heart over time. Now, it could be complicated by neglect of the relationship, lack of communication, unfaithfulness, perhaps other areas. But the result always brings disaster. And that is true for the nation of Israel and, of course, it's been shown in our study of the prophets. Years ago, there was a great preacher by the name of Henry Ironside. And in one of his books, he wrote these words, Sin never dies a natural death. It must be judged. And that's what we're seeing in our lesson today in the book of Hosea. Okay, now let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to mention again to my class something I had already previously said. And uh, in fact, it might be redundant. I may have said it in a video. My kids, as I've gotten older, say, Dad, you sure repeat yourself an awful lot. And so what I'm about to say, I might have said. <laughs> it may not mean anything to you. And you may want to just hit the fast forward button. And you can do that. But I'm going to remind my class that when you have a long study in the prophets, like we've had over the last two quarters, you can get the feeling that God is an angry God, a mean God just waiting for you to slip up. It's almost like you're walking on eggshells. And as soon as you mess up, he's waiting for that so that he can send judgment. And while the prophets do offer hope, basically their calling from God is that you have rebelled, you have sinned, and I'm tired of your rebellion, and I'm going to discipline you, and I'm going to send you into captivity. And if that's all we camp on when we study the prophets, then we miss God, and we really miss what God's trying to get across to the nations and to us is that God has a holy standard of righteousness. And his desire for his children is to be holy, not because it's hard for us, but, but because it's best for us. It produces healthiness and happiness. So when we're holy we're happy, and we get the fruit of righteousness, and we get the blessings of God. And so since we've been in these last two quarters in the prophets, we may forget that God is a God of love and a God of 
compassion. And, and we, I, we shouldn't miss that. Let me just tell you personally, after, oh, 35, 36 years of ministry, there's been times when I've made mistakes. I know you find that hard to believe, right? But what I've learned from God is, is that when I make mistakes and my heart is right, uh, and I'm trying to do right, and I'm trying to make the right decision, if it turns out to be a wrong decision, God doesn't judge me on that. God doesn't rain down his, his wrath on that. He may discipline me as a loving father. He may uh, make me have to live in that mistake for a little while as I learn. But God's not a mean God in those instances. Now, if, I'm, if he talks to me clearly and I know exactly what I'm supposed to do and I become stiff-necked and rebellious like the nations that our prophets are speaking to, then that brings challenges and brings God's uh, discipline, strong disciplines to me. And so what I want to remind my students and what I want to remind you is don't forget the loving nature of God, even though the prophets bring to us some very hard sayings and warnings against the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And of course, Hosea is speaking to the northern kingdom. Now, I, I want to make one quick exception. I'm kind of, again, backtracking a little bit because the exception uh, in this line of thought of God's judgment was Jonah. And if you remember, the, the book of Jonah was really uh, a, a book not against any nation, but against a racist bigot Jew by the name of Jonah. And he was called to go to a, a wicked place, Nineveh, he didn't want to go because he knew God's mercy would be shown if they repented. And if you remember that last lesson, Sean and I talked about this, that last lesson we had in Jonah, you know, he preached repentance and he went up on a hill to see what would happen. The people repented and it made him very angry. And in fact, it made him so angry, he just wanted to die. And it's almost as if, and Sean was the one who said this to me, it's almost as if he took his fist and shook it at God in blasphemy. And he said, I knew this was going to happen because I know that you are a gracious and compassionate God, that you're slow to anger, that you're abundant in loving kindness. And so I'm going to remind my class, and maybe you need to remind your class, of the character of God, that when people recognize their sin. When people repent of their sin and when people return, God forgives and God restores. In fact, uh, after this lesson, we'll have one more lesson in Hosea and we'll see the promise of restoration given. There'll be a little shift after uh, today's lesson and it softens up a little bit and we'll be reminded of the goodness and the mercifulness of God. Okay, now let's do this. Let's take a few minutes to look at today's lesson. And I'm going to give you my outline. Now, I, I want you to know that I'm not going to uh, give everything to you because I still have some more studying to do naturally. This is a couple weeks out. There's some nuggets there that you'll probably want to dig out. I intend to dig out. But I feel like it would be good for you to have my at least my structure it may help you may not, okay? So I'm going to begin, first of all, in verses 5, and I'm not going to read the verses because you can do that. You might even have your Bible open as we go through this. But in verses 5 through 11 of chapter 10, we see the cry of disobedience. If you remember, the northern kingdom was living in a false sense of security. There was a temporary affluence to their life. And so they're thinking things are pretty good, even though they're caught up in false worship and idolatrous worship. And so God sends Hosea with a very graphic illustration to raise the alarm to them. Remember, uh, uh, they were unfaithful as, uh, as a harlot would be, Gomer. You've, we've studied a little bit about Gomer. And it exposed them to God's discipline. And by the way, as I was reading for this class and reading for some of the com reading some of the commentaries, 
Uh, one of the commentary guys mentioned that Hosea was probably the smartest of all the prophets in intellect, and he realized the peril of social and political disarray that comes when people are stiff-necked and rebellious toward God. And that kind of flavors my outline. Now, in verses 5 through 11, the cry of disobedience, I'm going to break that down with three steps. And step number one is verses 5 and 6. And I'm going to say that disobedience brings shame. And that word shame is used in the verses. And the sad reality of shame, the shame of disobedience, is that it always happens after the fact, after you get caught. Isn't that right? Don't forget, don't, don't miss that, okay? Shame comes after you've been caught, and that's what's happened to the nation. Uh, I, I looked up that word shame that is used there, or the word ashamed, and it means to be pale. A root word means to grow pale. And so it's like, they were involved in all of this idolatry, and all of a sudden captivity comes, exile comes, and the judgment of God comes, and they realize, and their face becomes ashen or white. Now, it may sound crazy to us, but the calf of Beth Avon was even given credit for the Exodus. And they thought, and they feared this calf of Beth Avon more, and they feared the, their idols more. Then they feared God. And over these last several weeks, we've talked about false gods. We've talked about places, high places of worship and promiscuity. But their shame did not hit them until after God's discipline and God's judgment. And dear people, when shame hits, the sin has already been committed and it's too late. And you might want to bring that out, okay? Now, the second part of verses 5 through 11, the cry of disobedience, number two, is verses 7, 8, and 9. And my statement is going to be this, that false worship brings social and political decay. The moral decay of a nation is what leads the nation to follow ungodly kings or other officials. Now, you can draw some applications there to our nation today. Moral decay is like a gangrene. It, it just sets in and rots everything. If you'll notice in verse 7, it mentions the king. Verse 8 mentions the high places, the places they would run to worship. And so false worship brings social, political decay, and it begins with the bad heart of people. And I think that's worthy of some discussion. Now, the third thing I'm going to mention in the cry of disobedience is, is found in verses 10 and 11. And this is what I'm going to mention. Spiritual obstinance always brings God's chastisement. In verse 10, Hosea uses the word chastise. And that word's an interesting word in Hebrew. It literally means to hit with blows. It sounds harsh, doesn't it? And it is. But hidden within that word, there's the idea of the blows are to bring instruction and even reform. And so even in times of chastisement, we see God's compassion. And so the first part of my outline, verses 5 through 11, is the cry of disobedience. Now, my second part of my outline, verse 12, is a call of righteousness I want to show this verse to you, verse 12. It's a beautiful verse. So with a view to righteousness, reap in accordance with kindness, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. The call of righteousness. What a beautiful verse for us. The idea here is that the nation was producing fruit, but it was all the bad fruit, the the fruit of unrighteousness. And Hosea is saying, when you get it right, you'll see righteous fruit and a loving, compassionate God is ready to respond to that. And so point number two is the call of righteousness, verse 12. 
And then my third point is going to be the consequence of sin, verses 13 through 15. And you can look at all the references there. There's a reference to agriculture. You plowed, you reaped, you ate. This follows verse 12, which kind of connects to the fruit of righteousness they could have had. There's also a reference to military might, which failed them, which has some perhaps applications for us today. Verse 14 says, your fortress will be destroyed. Then verse 15 says, the end will come. And so that's kind of where I'm, I'm headed in my lesson when I present it. Now, as I said earlier, there's going to be a shift after our lesson. It, it kind of begins in chapter 12. We see it fleshed out better in chapter 13. The last lesson in Hosea will be chapter uh, 14. And it's going to shift to the restoration promise. Last week in our class, uh, Ken Gaines taught. And Ken mentioned something that really struck with me. And, and frankly, I don't remember if, if this came from Ken or Ken got it from Gary Briggs, who did a really a, a great job in his video that I watched last week. But the statement was this. Deportation does not mean destruction. Let me say that again to you. Deportation does not mean destruction. God deported them. They, he placed them in exile, in captivity. But it doesn't mean he destroyed them. In fact, he re begins to recall them. And what a, a, a blessing that is. Now, I would like to encourage you that after this lesson in chapter 12, that before you have that last lesson in chapter 14, that you surely read chapter 13 and then chapter 14. And Gary, I thought, as I said, did a wonderful job in bringing out some verses there. I'm not sure if you read in chapter 13, verses 4 through 6, but I want to read it to you as I close. Yet, God says, I have been the Lord your God since the land of Egypt, and you were not to know any God except me, for there is no Savior besides me. I cared for you in the wilderness, in the land of drought, and they had their pasture. They became satisfied. And being satisfied, their heart became proud. And they forgot me. Let's encourage one another. Not to become satisfied. Not to forget God in our pride. Because dear people, we as a nation today, the church today desperately needs God. And we must not become satisfied in pride to the point where we forget God. Like this nation that brought in all these false gods to worship. And in chapter 13, he simply reminds them, I'm your God. I brought you out of Egypt. I supplied you with all you needed for plenty. And yet you became satisfied and you forgot me. Oh, stress to our students. Have them stress to their family. We must not for, forget God. Well, God bless you. I, I think there's some stuff here for you. I believe we can have us a good lesson. And we'll end up Hosea on the next lesson. And we'll talk about the beauty of restoration. Don't forget to love your people and call your people. Let them know how important life groups are. God bless you. See you Sunday.